Welcome. It's good to uh, see you folks uh, here in our live audience and to you folks who are coming to us remotely. Uh, my name is Philip Martin. I'm senior investigative reporter at WGBH in Boston, and I'm today's moderator, and it's good to be back. Uh, today we're talking about the complexities of race and policing. Uh, it's obviously a very volatile uh, combination often, and with an emphasis on what can be done at both the state and local levels. This event is presented jointly with PRI's The World and WGBH. We're live streaming on the websites of the forum and on PRI's The World and also uh, live streaming on Facebook. Our panelists, starting from my immediate right, are David Williams, uh, professor of public health at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I feel like I've known David for a long time. Uh, we have John Shanks, director of the Fight Crime Invest in Kids Police Training Institute. He's retired U.S. Uh, Air Force Master Instructor uh, and Texas uh, Master Peace Officer. And Brian Kaur, uh, we spoke with Brian earlier on a Facebook Live. He's president of the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. And uh, joining us remotely, we have uh, Tracy Mears, professor of law at Yale Law School. This program, by the way, will include a Q&A. Uh, we'd like to hear from you, and you can also email us uh, those questions should be directed to, this is one word, of course, the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. I'm going to repeat that, the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. You can participate in a chat that's happening on the forum site right now. I'm going to turn uh, uh, to David Williams. Uh, David, you study uh, social and health disparities. Uh, give us a big picture view of how these intersect with, the, with law enforcement and policing. Thank you. The big picture view is that we have overwhelming scientific evidence of the disproportionate targeting of people of color by law enforcement. Just last year, the American Psychological Association released a national study that found that 40% of African-American males and 25% of Latino males compared to 15% of white males reported that they have been st unfairly stopped, physically threatened, or searched by the police. So that is a, a very high number and it's consistent with a lot um, of other evidence. Another example would be a 2015 study that looked at 14 major jurisdictions in the United States and looked at the risk of driving while black. And in every single one of them, black drivers were more likely to be stopped uh, and searched by the police than, than drivers of other races. And strikingly, in 13 of the 14 um, uh, jurisdictions, blacks were less likely to have contraband. So contraband was more likely found on white drivers who had been stopped, but blacks were disproportionately more likely to be stopped. So what I would say is that when we talk about the race and policing issue, we are looking at a symptom of a more systematic pattern of racial inequality in the United States. And, and this discrimination manifests itself in multiple other domains of life that be, create a pattern of cumulative stressful events and stressors that actually adversely impacts health. Uh, so we, we really have to think of the signific significant and negative health impact uh, of these experiences. The one last thing that I would say as we think of the big picture, um, these problems have been going on for a while. For the prior eight years, we had a justice department that was very committed to studying the, the jurisdictions where problems had occurred and providing guidance so that departments could do better and strategies that they could be, implement. But elections have consequences. And so we don't have the same Justice Department that we had. And it does mean that a lot of what will take place now has to take place at the state and local level and not with as much prodding at the federal level. We're going to talk about that some more, the, the differences that have occurred uh, between uh, the old administration, new administration, in terms of uh, uh, the Justice Department and uh, policing. Uh, John, you're a veteran police officer. Uh, you've been there, you've, you, and you head the uh, Police Training Institute as part of a program called Fight Crime, Invest in Kids. Tell us about your work and what you're doing to address racial uh, and policing challenges, especially uh, in the, if you will, this new period. Yes, absolutely. So Fight Crime Investing Kids, um, we're an organization, nonprofit out of Washington, D.C., 
And uh, 5,000 members, all appointed police chiefs, elected sheriffs, and prosecutors. And our, our, our main focus is providing youth and, and children and families to be able to raise children that are what we call citizen ready, but ready to, um, to be successful as citizens of this country. And in recent years, uh, incidents such as Ferguson and, and others throughout our country, um, the national dialogue about police and community relations is at a level that it, we've never seen before. And uh, the police, as well as the communities, are trying to figure out how do we fix this? How do we come together and address these issues? So in October of 2015, we called together our members and, and polled them and said, what are the things that law enforcement needs to be able to do a better job, to be able to work with young people, to work with communities of color, to stop the violence, right? To, to create a, a social norm that is, is gonna be good for us. Our summit was co-hosted by members of the President's 24th Century uh, Policing Task Force, Charles Ramsey, former commissioner in Philadelphia and former King County Sheriff Sue Rahr, uh, came in and, and hosted this, this forum. Uh, one notable concept that came out of the forum was that while community-oriented policing is, was a great start, it didn't address all the issues that needed to be addressed. It didn't address how police officers were communicating, were interacting, were empathizing with the communities that they were serving. Uh, leaders stated during the training that um, that the need for additional law enforcement training on key topic areas, uh, knowledge-based things that would allow them to do a better job when encountering uh, situations. And, and those four areas, uh, four disciplines that we came up with, or, or our members did, adolescent brain development, de-escalation, implicit bias, and informed response to trauma. Now I can tell you, as 22 years as, as a police officer working uh, both in the military and the Air Force, but on, on the streets in San Antonio, Texas, I, nobody ever taught me about adolescent brain development. I, I didn't know anything about how kids think and react and respond. And I, I wish I had that training before my children were born, to be quite honest, <laughs> right? And trauma. When you think about trauma and you think about PTSD, and we'll talk about that later, but I know, and my colleague, who also a career police officer out of Michigan and, uh, and Indiana, never have we been, had been trained on trauma, right? So the police chiefs are telling us our officers need to have a better understanding of trauma. So we, uh, we put together, I also wanna just share a quote with you, the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Chief Richard Height during our summit said, the era of hands-on policing in the 70s and 80s is gone. All right? He says, we can't allow ourselves not to have this real conversation to move things forward. Since that summit, our research and interaction with law enforcement leaders, practitioners, and community members uh, resulted in a common theme, and that is everyone expects and deserves to be treated fairly and with respect and those who are responsible for policing in our communities must be provided with the tools to adequately respond to situations as they occur. Uh, on a personal note, and again, just uh, I, I had already said this, but in all of my years in policing, never even thought about adolescent brain development or trauma, and those are two key things, um, but also implicit bias. You know, um, we talked about being fair, we talked about being impartial, but we never delved into what's going on in our brains. What, and, and not so much uh, recognizing the bias, but how do you change that behavior? How do you take those biases and understand them to a point to where you can actually treat people fair and for lack of a bit better when you encounter them on the street. And, and it's a major, major question, and it's one that we would we'd like to revisit when we, uh, it's, and during the question Absolutely. and answer yep. uh, session. I mean, it's uh, also that, that of, of training, that becomes a, an imperative as well, doesn't it? Absolutely. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to uh, just step back for a second and look at a conversation uh, that President Obama, I, I'm sure many of you recall this, uh, that he hosted within the past year with members of the task force on 20th century policing. This of course is in the wake of Ferguson, Eric Garner, the uh, Tamir Rice case in Cleveland, 
Obama saw this real urgency uh, to addressing the issue of policing and race. Uh, more than 2,100 police shootings since 2015, according to the Washington Post, various circumstances, of course. We'll be talking about the task force recommendations later in the discussion and about where we go from here with a new administration now in place, the Trump administration. But I think the first thing we want to do is take a look at a, a video clip. And this clip uh, is uh, with President Obama hosting a conversation in community policing and criminal justice. Thanks to uh, Lori Robinson and Charles Ramsey and the members of that task force, we came up with a set of recommendations. And the good news is, is that over the last uh, several months since uh, the report was issued, we have seen uh, a lot of law enforcement officers, a lot of chiefs, a lot of departments begin to examine these recommendations and figure out how they can implement them. We've, we've seen real progress with respect to data gathering. We've seen real progress with respect to training. We've seen progress with respect to transparency and outreach to communities. The bad news is, uh, as we saw so painfully this week, uh, that uh, this is a really hard job. We're not there yet. We're not even close to being there yet, where we want to be. We're not at a point yet where uh, communities of color feel confident that their police departments are serving them uh, with dignity and respect and equality, and we're not at the point yet where police departments feel uh, adequately as supported uh, at all levels. So what we've done here is to build off the task force report and find out what's working, what's not, and what more do we have to do in order to bring the country and communities around the country together uh, and make more progress on this front. This is the perfect time to bring in Tracy. Uh, Tracy, you were a member of, the, uh, of President Obama's task force. And so I'm interested in hearing your view uh, on the challenges ahead. You focus in your research on procedural justice. Can you talk about that and about uh, what the task force, uh, essentially what's ahead given uh, where we are now in terms of a new administration? Sure. Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's interesting. One of the things that was really important in our work on the president's task force in 21st century policing was to understand that even though policing in the last 30 years or so has made great strides in doing work, taking seriously the idea that police should be involved in crime reduction, a relatively new idea, that that goal should not be self-justifying. In other words, it's important for policing agencies to understand that crime reduction by any means necessary was not really what members of the public want. They really want is to be treated in ways that um, encourages their trust in policing and law enforcement generally, and also law and government. And decades of research show that the basis of how people understand the ways in which they'll trust legal authorities is this idea of procedural justice that you just mentioned. Four factors really matter. A few of them we've already talked about in the first few minutes of this, um, of this session. That is, people really desire to be treated with dignity and respect, just as President Obama noted. Um, people also care a lot about what we call voice in social psychology. In an interaction with um, a police officer or some other legal authority, people really care a great deal about telling their side of the story and telling what the situation is from their perspective. At a higher level, people in communities and communities as a general matter like to be able to have input in setting out the goals and, pro um, goals and projects of the agency input into legislation and policy and so forth. Third, people care a lot about fair decision making. And by that I mean people are looking for indicia that decisions are fair and just and free from bias. And one way they do that is to look for indications of transparency, neutrality, factuality. 
That is, that decisions are based in facts that a legal authority can point to, rather than saying something like, the decision is this way because I said so. And fourth, people care a great deal about what we call motive-based trust. What they're looking for are indications in an authority's actions, an authority like a police officer, that that officer or the agency as a general matter is going to treat them benevolently in the future. Importantly, and then I think my three minutes are about up, it's not just about the particular interaction between a person and the officer when you're thinking about motive-based trust. People also make these decisions by thinking about how people like them are treated right now, uh, their friends, their family members, and they pay attention to how members of their groups have been treated in the past. So it has a historical measure too. That's why in any given city, let's say Boston, folks are paying attention to how police are treating folks in Cleveland or Ferguson, right? Because they're thinking about how their treatment tells them who they are as a member of the group to which they belong. Well, we're, I, would, I can't wait to uh, explore this further because motive-based trust, uh, you think immediately about how this squares, uh, and if it is in counterposition uh, to a president who sees himself as a law and order president and, and sees the, the Justice Department that, uh, that way. So I'd like to, uh, when, in the question and answer, session. Let's see if we could uh, explore that further. Brian, you had a national organization for the civilian oversight of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, civilian involvement is obviously crucial. In mm -hmm. fact, it's critical. But can you tell us what this means, essentially? Sure. So civilian oversight generally means some way, shape, or form in which people who are not sworn law enforcement officers are part of looking at police department policies and procedures, looking at complaints, and looking at what we're asking our police departments to do. You know, not just the appointing authority, the city manager, the mayor, but often a board of community members who can review complaints, but also look at these broader policy issues. And civilian oversight has been around for quite a while. Earliest efforts go back to the 20s, but in its current form, it's really been around for about 30 or 40 years. Probably the oldest agency currently active is Kansas City, which goes back a few decades. But it has been spreading nationally. We really have seen a movement, um, in some ways not just since uh, Ferguson, as many people would say, but really even going back to the arrest of Professor Gates here in, well, across the river in Cambridge, where I work for my day job. We have seen an increasing focus on communities coming together and saying, we need civilian oversight. And historically, civilian oversight was very reactive. A specific incident would happen, uh, people would make demands, a board would be uh, impaneled, and then you would start to look at complaints and problems. Where it has really moved toward is being proactive. So it's more front-end accountability than just trying to figure out what happened and was it done well. And that has been a very important effort in having oversight have a voice in directing where police departments are going, the kind of leadership police departments have, and in looking, again, not just at specific issues, but how to transform the nature of policing, how to ensure that the community has a voice in all aspects of law enforcement. And to that end, uh, one of the things that i thinking about the theme of this panel, I would say is most important is as we see this shift nationally, right? As we see a shift from Black Lives Matter to Blue Lives Matter in the national rhetoric, we have to really find ways to institutionalize oversight and institutionalize these changes at the state and local levels. One thing I highly recommend is the President's Task Force report on 21st century policing. That also had an implementation guide, which gave very specific ways that police departments, communities, activists can be involved in taking those recommendations and making them real. And it's something that my organization, NACOL, is pushing because we have to keep that report alive. We had a huge amount of work. Uh, you know, Tracy Mears was on that panel. We had leaders in law enforcement, people from Black Lives Matter, who came to unity around a set of very powerful recommendations. So I would say to that end, we have to take all that work, keep it alive, implement it at the state and local levels, but also make sure that we're doing it not just as activists or just as police, 
but doing it together. Part of my vision for civilian oversight is that we do accountability, but we're also a bridge. We're a way to help link communities and law enforcement because often uh, people, I hate to say sides, but on both sides of that interaction have undergone trauma. Trauma-informed policing is very important for police to understand the trauma of those that they encounter, but it's also very important for police to understand the trauma that they experience, whether it's the day-to-day -day work of policing where you're running from call to call to call, never knowing what you might encounter, and the trauma that they may have undergone as individuals growing up in their lives. And at the same time, it's important for communities to understand the trauma that police officers undergo so that we can make realistic um, say demands, have realistic expectations, offer realistic goals for our police departments and for law enforcement. So uh, for me at this point, looking at that task force report is vital because for civilian oversight to be effective, for it to be institutionalized, we have to as a society take on those recommendations and we have to empower civilian oversight to do that front end accountability, not just to look at what went wrong when something goes wrong. Again, uh, in the context of this discussion, and we'll sort of throw out off an Uber uh, question, uh, which I'd like the panel to discuss later, is again, in the context of 21st century policing, 21st century policing seems to be coming in conflict with 20th century policing. If you uh, take uh, literally the notion of returning to a law and order mm -hmm. set of priorities, law and order has been code for years, has it not? And, uh, but it's something to keep in mind uh, in the, as we bridge uh, to this next clip and then uh, bridge to the questions. I'd like to um, show a clip uh, at this point from uh, Fight Crime, Invest in Kids. Uh, children, kids are part of the dynamic uh, when you're talking about policing and uh, in race. In the end, you got to decide whether or not you're going to smoke weed or not. You got to decide whether or not you're going to come to school or not. You got to decide whether or not you're going to let somebody talk you into committing a crime. People's lives destroyed, families destroyed, you know, over decisions that somebody else made. It may destroy your life, but you don't understand the decisions you make can destroy other people's lives. So you need to think about that whenever you're, uh, when you're making decisions. Because I'm a kid off the west side of Chicago. And then one of the biggest deals when I speak to kids is I believe firmly and don't lie to them. I was a knucklehead. I was the one that was out here that everybody is sitting here speaking about now. But due to teachers, due to people who's concerned, who gave me one message, if you can lead somebody down the wrong way in life, you can lead them down the right way. Okay. John, what's going on in that, in that clip, and, uh, and what about the role of mentoring? Well, it's, it's huge, and that clip actually was uh, in Jackson, Mississippi. We did a town hall with some youth and some law enforcement leaders. But really bringing the, the young people, young men of color, together with law enforcement leaders to talk about uh, having that, those hard conversations but those open conversations about uh, both sides, the law enforcement's responsible and the youth are responsible. As the chief said, you make the decision, right, uh, where you want to go. But again, having that mutual respect and empathy amongst each other to grow as a community. And I think that kind of shows when you bring the two sides together, that's what happens. It, it can't be an us versus them mentality. We have to come together as a community. Well, let me ask you this question, uh, perhaps a difficult question. Uh, if you represent thousands of police chiefs who care about this issue. That, that's what we're told. Now, racial disparities at the point of arrest, including for youth, are, are probably the greatest in the, in the system. You would you probably agree with that, right? Yeah. So why are so many police officers, and this in the context of training, sort of refusing to be trained in implicit bias or walking out of lectures on the topic according to a Washington Post article? I, I think uh, part of it is the way it's presented to them. Um, I think police officers are a unique group of, of people that are doing a very difficult job. Um, I think none of them come into this work uh, with bad intentions. Um, but when you, they're constantly under the microscope. So when we go in and we start talking about these hard issues, uh, implicit bias, 
right? And and you and you tell them you have bias. Everybody has bias. What we what we're doing different that has been really successful is we do it in a non-accusatory manner, and it's also this old retired Texas cop standing in front of him saying, "Guys, I've walked in your shoes, right? I I've learned to recognize my biases, and." I'm telling you, these things exist, and they exist in you, and they're going to continue to exist in you. The reality is you can change how you respond to those biases, and that's what we hope to achieve, is changing the way you as a professional out there on the street working uh, within a diverse community, how you can change your response to individuals by knowing what's going on inside of you. The bias and, and the, the Harvard implicit bias online tool, I don't care how many times you take it, guess what? You're biased and those same results are gonna keep coming back. And, and that's good, right? And that's, that's an eye opener. But the reality is I can embrace that and understand it and then malleable, right? Change how I address people as a law enforcement professional on the street. So having cops teaching cops I think is key. Um, teaching it in a non-threatening and non-accusatory manner and then being able to give, uh, we do a lot of interactivity, a lot of discussion, a lot of exercises, um, and it, it just, it works. And I think that when the cops get up and walk out of the room, I think something has been said somewhere that where they said, all right, I'm done here and I'm out. And I, I can't speak specifically for them, but I, I know a lot of those guys. <laughs> well, well um, um, David, uh, what's, what's your view about that? Uh, I think it's not just cops. The implicit bias problem is a societal-wide problem. It, it's a function of the culture in which we have raised and the messages that we have received that are deeply embedded um, in our minds. I completely agree that the way we talk about it is crucial. I, I like to tell my students that I'm a prejudiced person. And I say I'm a prejudiced person because I like to think of myself as a normal human being. And if I am a normal human being, I'm very likely to be prejudiced, not necessarily racially prejudiced, but, but to have so every society, every culture, every context has in-groups and out-groups, groups that are negatively stereotyped. And, and it's not just about police officers. So I, I think part of the issue is, is showing folks how normative this is. And you are just part of the human family if you have biases because every society has its out groups and in groups and it's what's deeply embedded in your mind as a result of the culture and society in which you were raised. And the good news is there are a number of strategies that can be implemented that can help you to react differently and, and not to do the things that would come naturally for you. And, and which also raises a question, and Tracy, I want to turn to you in just a second, but, but Brian, the, uh, this whole notion, is there enough empathy given to the position of police officers in the type of work that you do? Do you understand mm -hmm. perhaps uh, uh, the, the position police officers face in dealing with, uh, uh, with the everyday norms of policing? Mm -hmm. Uh, you, yeah. you, you spoke of trauma, that's why I'm asking right. you that question. Uh, so I'll try to do this without going on too long, but I have three connected points. So thinking about training, I got to sit in on a couple of trainings that the Cambridge Police Department uh, personnel who were implementing procedural justice and legitimacy after working with Dr. Mears after the Gates arrest, watching them do that training with a broader group of people. The mass chiefs of police asked them to come in, train their officers, and it was exactly as you described. People stood up and yelled, people read the newspaper, and it, this was a police officer doing the training. And part of the challenge is that we have to move from a mindset of being warriors to being guardians. And what they heard was, you're telling us basically to undermine our safety. If we have to go up to people and explain what we're doing, that makes them think that we're not in charge and we have to be in charge. So there's a shift that has to happen. And one of the interesting things was that younger officers who wouldn't say anything in the broad group, came up afterward and went to the deputy superintendent who was doing the training and said, you know, I've only been out of the academy for a year and I really appreciate what you said because that's not what we're hearing. So it's, a, it's going to take some time and some generational shifting. The other piece is that in oversight, it's vital that people doing civilian oversight get training. 
people must be trained on police policy, practices, procedures. They're not going to be police, but they have to have an understanding of what we ask police to do. So in that way, I think, I wouldn't say it's sympathetic, but it's understanding the charge and understanding this is what our community has asked of these officers. So when we're looking at, did the officers do what they were supposed to do? Those people involved in investigating, reviewing complaints, or board members understand what it is the police are being asked to do. And if we look at that and say, you know, in this instance, the police did everything they were supposed to do, but something still went wrong. Again, the arrest of Professor Gates. If you look at the policies and procedures, you know, Sergeant Jim Crowley didn't do anything wrong, but obviously what happened was not a good outcome. So the department had to look at where the policies and procedures. We had community members as part of that. Uh, the Police Executive Research Forum, which again included Tracy Mears on this panel of community members and outside experts, decided that we needed to change our policies and procedures. So in that way, again, I think it's not just being sympathetic, but it's understanding what we ask our police departments to do. And when we look at that and we say, you know, we're asking them to do something that isn't the right thing, then our role is to help them change that and ask of them what we need them to do. Since you mentioned Tracy, I know this is a perfect time to transition to Tracy. Uh, Tracy, the, the key challenge for all of us in reforming policing uh, is the assumption uh, that officers want to change, that they want to embrace the community, and, and that the power structure in which law enforcement uh, uh, is nested wants a more fair, rational, just form of policing. But what happens when those assumptions are plain wrong? Uh, getting again into the whole notion of um, 21st versus 20th century policing. Uh, what, uh, what, what happens uh, when doing business is, as usual is just fine? And uh, how do you transcend uh, those political realities uh, for, for change? Uh, you were on the uh, task force, and I assume that that must have come up. It did, but I think there are a couple things that might surprise folks uh, in the audience. First of all, if you look around the country and you look to the law, uh, the law enforcement executives in the largest cities of the country, the people who are doing this work in the toughest situations, you'll find that many of those law enforcement leaders um, adopt what we would call very progressive approaches to doing law enforcement. And that is because their job is tough and they understand that they need community support to get the job done, in part because the expectations of them are so vast, going back to what David Williams was talking about. Um, we actually expect police officers and policing organizations to do a lot of work that one would think was traditionally a social safety net kind of task, dealing with people who are experiencing challenge be challenges because of mental illness, um, dealing with um, children who aren't necessarily um, supervised, all sorts of social dislocations because of poverty. And police are the only institution that are available 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. And so we expect them to do all kinds of things. And the leaders of the largest cities understand this and are actually quite progressive. Now, at the national level, we just had a change of administration that suggests that that's not what uh, policing leaders want to do. And certainly we've seen some union uh, line level supporters seem to go along with that, um, that attitude. But I don't think that that attitude is as pre prevalent or representative, certainly among people who are actually leading um, policy in institutions as one might think. So that's one area of clash. Um, I think Another issue to pay attention to is that the federal government actually has a very limited role. And I'm saying this as someone who served on President Obama's um, task force on 21st century policing. He, President Obama, um, wanted to lead in the context of a, of a bully pulpit and take very limited federal resources to nudge agencies forward. But the reality is that most of this work that's going to get done is going to take place at the state and local level, and there's going to have to be decisions made at the local and state level to devote resources to these issues. That's instructive, and it also brings us to a point about local policing, uh, something uh, uh, David is uh, also an expert in. 
Uh, we've had a situation in Everett, Massachusetts, where you've done a study looking at local policing and interaction between community uh, and, and, and local police and the nexus to areas of, uh, of uh, where folks have come together and where they've uh, sort of uh, fallen uh, apart. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't call myself an expert in local policing, but I have cl looked closely at what Everett, Massachusetts, a town not very far from here, has done. Um, and uh, it was recognized uh, for its work by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in get, winning a Culture of Health Prize as a community that was really doing innovative things. What, what kind of community is Everett, if you could describe um, it? Everett is a, a, a small community with a police force that is predominantly white with a large and growing minority population. There are many Portuguese-speaking residents and many Spanish-speaking residents, for example. And one of the efforts on the part of the police, the leadership of the police department in Everett was to make the police much more integrated into the community. For example, there were crash courses in Portuguese and Spanish uh, for some of the officers, so at least they would learn some basics of interacting with the, with the community. There were uh, participation of police officers in community meetings so that they would engage with the, com with the community, learn hair grievances that the community had. There was a commitment to transparency, so with an annual report about what was happening with the police department. Um, there were, uh, one of the more innovative programs was having police officers committed once a week to go to the local high school and sit in the cafeteria and have lunch with the teenagers. Um, but it, it all reflected, and I think that has been done in, in other cities. Cincinnati, Ohio has done some innovative things along those lines, too. The, uh, I've heard the police chief there mm -hmm. talk about new recruits the first day, the first week. He sends them out to a homeless shelter, to a, a kindergarten class. Mm -hmm. And so he's trying to change their, their image and vision that they are actually there to serve and to understand and meet the needs of the community. And when you, you build those kinds of relationships, it certainly transforms uh, or transforms the possibilities of what can happen in terms of both the, how the community thinks of and sees the police officers and how the police officers relate to the needs of the community. John, briefly, uh, as a former police officer and a trainer currently, uh, how does that sound to you? I mean, does that sound like a, a good methodology? Is that is that uh, something that you recommend Absolutely. on the local level? Absolutely. And we're, we're exploring a lot of things, especially um, Austin, Texas. We were down there doing some training. And the Austin Police Department takes all of their police recruits uh, on different days of training, and they put them on a bus, and they visit every single neighborhood in the city. And they get off the bus, and they go into playgrounds, and they go into community centers, and they interact with the people. So when, the, when a, a police recruit graduates from the police academy, they have some experience in every city. And uh, our program, we're, we're actually not only training just police officers, but youth as well, and bringing the youth and law enforcement together. And having that interaction, it, it is so exciting to watch as these young people and police officers sit down over a meal and talk and share and, and realize that, oh, you're a person? You have, you have children and a family at home? And oh, wait, you have needs as, as a youth? Uh, the dynamic that grows out of that is amazing. And so absolutely, this is the model that needs to take place. And everyone agrees on Texas barbecue, right? Oh, you can't go wrong with <laughs> Texas right, barbecue. That's, right. um, that's a we, fact. We have a few minutes uh, to take some, uh, some questions uh, from our, our, our audience, uh, Lisa. Right, thank you, everyone. Uh, so we have a number of questions coming in online, and here's one from a viewer in Milwaukee. How has police racial violence been normalized by the mainstream media, Hollywood, and white public opinion? And how has this challenged adoption of meaningful community policing efforts by local law enforcement agencies? It's a question about images in media and how this is impacting the situation. Tracy, anyone like to, who'd like to take that on? I'm happy to talk about that a bit. I think it goes back to some of the issues we were talking about with respect to some police resistance to training, actually. You know, there's an idea that as long as what police are doing is consistent with policy, policy that doesn't necessarily look to an idea that 
you know, the most important thing is to preserve life, everyone's life, not just the police officer's life. Um, and instead, just try to figure out what Brian was saying, whether the uh, behavior was blameworthy. You know, the fact that uh, policing agencies don't take the uh, approach that, let's say, the Federal Aviation uh, Administration takes, which is anytime there's a plane crash, we're going to figure out what happened and try to avoid this outcome, regardless of whether the um, pilot was drinking or something. Instead, just that this is an outcome we want to avoid. You know, that approach, I do think, normalizes the violence and makes it seem sometimes like unfortunate incidents that were unavoidable rather than something that we should all be working toward to change. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's take another one. This just came in from Facebook. Can implicit bias be identified during the hiring process and be addressed? I think this is directed towards police hiring. And um, we all have it. So right. the, the reality is every person from around age one starts developing biases based on input that we receive growing up from our parents, from the media, from teachers. So I don't know that we can address it. I think what the, you know, law enforcement hiring is very different today than it was 40 years ago. The, the reality is, I think what they do now is look for people who are open, willing to adopt and able to adapt to change. And it's, you know, hiring well-educated professional individuals that can accept the idea that I have bias and then be able to make that change. I don't know that you can address that in a employment interview or, or employment screening because it's the reality is we all have it. Right. Yeah, I uh, think part of the question is to, I got from the questioner is that uh, are there things that could be done routinely to train all police officers mm -hmm. on implicit bias? And if that's the question, yes, we can. We, we know strategies that, that could be used and it would be well for all of us. And remember, this is about police, but this is about all of us, regardless of what profession we're working in, to, to get mm -hmm. implicit bias training. Right. And I'll just jump on that quickly because one of the things I've heard a lot from communities is that, well, this whole implicit bias thing, this is just a way to let people off the hook by saying, it's not their fault, everyone's biased. And it's actually the opposite because we have to address the bias that everyone has in order to change how things are done. It's not to let people off the hook, but it's actually to change how policing is done. And just as David said, to change how all of our fields are done. Mm -hmm. We all have to recognize what biases we bring to the table in order to do our work as impartially and fairly as possible. And Tracy had mentioned that you know the big city police chiefs are doing a, a good job at identifying this. They have resources, they have big budgets. What, you know, think about this, 90% of law enforcement agencies in America have 10 or less officers. Who's training those guys? We have to find a way to well, get this answer message. answer that the president's task force offered was to say that there shouldn't be those agencies, just to be provocative. Mm -hmm. And it's one idea is actually we shouldn't have policing agencies of fewer than 50 mm -hmm. and actually encourage agencies to consolidate if we're looking for very specific recommendations mm -hmm. and strategies. Mm -hmm. Is there also a way of consolidating training? I mean, you have uh, John's group, you have groups like Strategies for Youth, you have uh, the, the Interrupters out of Chicago, you have any number of groups. So what about consolidation of training? Would that be paramount and important? It's difficult to consolidate training when, as John mentioned, agencies um, are, very, are very small because they have to actually be able to uh, devote the resources to participate in that kind of training. So it's kind of a chicken and egg problem as an organizational matter. Well, I, I'm sorry, I, sh I should have said methodology as opposed to uh, actual uh, f coming together like uh, as I traders, uh, but methodology. Uh, is, there yes. a, is there a universal methodology that might be uh, uh, pertinent to talk to, to police, uh, police training, police accountability? Well, I think that I think, um, and Brian would know some of this too, one of the recommendations that we offered in the President's Task Force report are you know, specific ideas about how uh, police officers should be trained, 
and there are posts in every um, state across the country that could actually adopt these recommendations. And we could have much more of a, of a national platform. You know, one of the facts of the, the reality of our, of our country is that we decided to deliver criminal justice uh, resources at the state and local level rather than at the national level as is done in European countries. All right. Uh, I think we have another time for another question. Yes, Lisa? thank you. We'll take one more here, and then we'll see if our audience has one. Or here, here's someone here who does have a question. So we'll see. Thank you. Um, so we've talked a lot about um, reforms of policing, um, but there's kind of another branch of people, um, activists, community organizers, um, and people who are who are looking at policing as. Um, a systemic issue, um, racist policing as a systemic issue that's deeply rooted in kind of the history of policing in the U.S. that are looking um, a little bit further towards police abolition. Um, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on police abolition as an idea or at least um, on reforms that lead to um, decreased police presence, decreased funding to police departments, and a greater focus on community-based solutions, conflict resolution, um, and transformative justice. Yeah. Well, you know, again, I'll start with this, not that I'm the only one that has anything to say. That it's interesting because this is obviously coming up a lot now, and it's partly been part of the Black Lives Matter movement, but the questions about can we have a society free of police? Some of those things are looking at, as people have said, we ask police to do a whole array of things. So in Cambridge, our police department has two social workers. They've got a homeless outreach unit because at the moment, they're still being asked to do things that perhaps we shouldn't ask police to do. The other side of it is what is the role of policing? Right? So is the role of policing to go around with firearms and jump into situations and stop bad things? Is it to deal with quality of life issues? Is it to check and make sure no one's breaking into your home when you're on vacation? So there's a broader question about what is it that we ask police to do? Um, I'd say most people sort of in the middle would say that there probably will for the time foreseeable be a need to have police departments doing policing. But the question is what do they do? And the other thing I'll just say is there are a lot of communities that I say many people would say are over-policed, and yet they're not asking for the abolition of police generally. They're asking for policing that's appropriate and accountable. So to the extent that we can find policing that is responsive to community needs, uh, that may obviate some of the calls for the abolition of police. So it's not a complete answer to your question, but I think I wanted to get some of those issues that underlie your question. John? Yeah, well, I just think you look at the history of policing and, and where we've come from the 60s, 70s, 80s to where we are today, it, it, there's huge changes. And I think as we look at police legitimacy, procedural justice, and all these great things that are happening in our profession, um, we're seeing changes. But as, as Brian said, we, we took a group of fifth grade uh, students in Washington, D.C., and we said, okay, tomorrow morning, there's no more police. You know what their biggest fear was? Who is going to take care of their mother? All right. The reality is police are in places today that, that you never saw them before. You can't go to a high school sporting event without police officers being present. You can't go to church without a police officer being present. And so they're, they're historically reactionary, right? They're there because something bad has happened and they need to be there to protect us so that we can live our lives in, in a free society. So when we say abolish police, we're also saying abolish those protections, right? And we need those protections to be able to live in this free society. But I think we can do a better job and we can definitely, I think procedural justice, legitimacy and policing, all of these things we are talking about, we're on the right path, all right? And getting in our, again, used to be, all you needed to be was a cop was a GED. Most police officers today have at least a bachelor's. Some, many have master's degrees. It's a smarter, more professional police force than we've seen in the past. I think Lisa, I just want, thank you. I think I just want to take one last question. Please. I know we have to wrap up, but this has come in uh, from several ends. Does having more police of color on a force actually lead to less discrimination? What are the stats on that? Isn't it actually more effective to focus on community policy practices that build trust and integrate the police into neighborhoods, whatever their race? I give up with a David. Yeah. 
I, I don't know about the statistics on that specifically. Uh, I know in general, so I know in the area of medicine, that having more um, persons of, of, of multiple minority backgrounds actually improves the quality of care. Um, we also know that persons who come uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds are more likely to be willing to work empathetically and effectively with communities of color and in, in, in some ways practice in the areas of primary care medicine so they work in the areas where there are greater needs within the healthcare system. I'm not sure the extent to which that generalizes to the police and I would. Mm -hmm. would. One of the things we look at when we go into a police department to train is does the police department represent the community it serves? And I'll tell you, uh, from what we have seen firsthand, is in most cases, yes, the police departments ha represent the community. If there's a strong Asian community, they have Asian officers. Strong black community, they have black officers. And, they, and, and they're serving diversely throughout the community. So I think we've made great strides in that area. Um, but again, you got to apply for the jobs. They hire who applies. So uh, you mentioned Everett. Everett may be a very, you know, a strong, I have family there, so strong Irish community, right, with a lot of uh, young Irish men that want to be policemen, and that's who your police force is. But I, I think they are doing things to help integrate more people from diverse backgrounds to police in Everett to meet the needs of that society. Well, the only thing I would add, well, two things I'll add quickly. One is that it makes a difference on other levels, right? If you have a police department that looks like the community it's policing, it makes a difference in how the community interacts with the police. It's not a be all and end or be all or end all. But the other thing is gender. If we look at the gender makeup of police departments, that's something that can make a big difference. So Tracy, think about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, I've, I've actually I've interviewed uh, uh, folks in a number of cities, including Detroit, who thought it didn't make much difference. Now, these are people on the streets, of course, who felt that uh, uh, Detroit, of course, has had a black police force for a long time. So it doesn't, is it a question of over time it makes, uh, uh, I mean, is it a question of time? Is it a question of uh, de 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 degree of uh, commitment beyond color? Uh, what, what's been your experience, especially on the task force? Right. My experience is when often when people are asking that question, they're thinking about a very particular outcome. And the outcome that people are very focused on right now are um, is the number of people who are either killed or hurt civilians by police. And there's very little research actually suggesting that having more um, people of color be officers is going to change that number substantially, which would reflect what you had uh, seen in your conversation with folks in Detroit. You know, people in communities that I've done research um, with respect to that will say, doesn't matter what color the officer is, every officer is blue, is the way they would say, um, something like that. That said, there is more recent and s more sophisticated research showing that um, it can make some difference in some context. So there's a paper by Jeff Fagan and my colleague Yosha, J-O-S-C-H-A, Lejewe, L-E-G-E-W-I-E, showing that um, having a higher proportion of um, African-American officers in particular makes a difference in cross-race interactions. Um, but there isn't a ton of research there. Um, I would just go back to what Brian is saying, that you want to do it because people think that agencies are more legitimate and, um, you know, and trustworthy when the agency actually reflects um, who they are in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, thank you. Uh, we are going to wrap up. And I, I promise, though, uh, one of the things I promised certainly before we wrap up is to hear from our panelists about uh, solutions. Uh, now, it seems, uh, I know you're incredulous, the whole notion of solutions <laughs> to something this, this massive. Uh, but I think there are some suggestions here that we have from, uh, from our, our panelists. And let's, uh, let's, let's start uh, uh, from this end, uh, uh, Brian. All right. Well, again, a lot of it is 
how do we transform the conversation nationally, right? How do we move from a place of police being seen as warriors to being guardians, as being people who come in to, whether it's to occupy a community or to be the, the warriors to fight crime, to people who are part of a community? If you go back to uh, the 1820s, the founding of the London Metropolitan Police, uh, they're attributed to Sir Robert Peel, who was the person that organized the police department. But one of the key concepts is the police are the community and the community are the police. And we have to go back to that. Uh, the other piece I'd say is we have to do more work to make sure that there's evidence, just as we've been talking, about what makes a difference in policing, what makes a difference in civilian oversight. I know our organization, NACOL, is now working on a two-year grant from the Department of Justice, the COPS Office, Community-Oriented Policing Services, to look at what are the best types of civilian oversight and how does that affect outcomes in your community. So doing that kind of research that can make a real difference in the lives of people on the ground is vital. So but those are my two things I'd offer. Thank you, John. Well, obviously training, um, because that's the business I'm in right now. But, uh, you know, working, and, and I, I believe really strongly about police legitimacy, right? We have to be legitimate. We answer to the public. and. I think getting to know the people you serve, interacting with them, and building trust. Trust is, is key to, to, when I call the police, I wanna know that when they arrive, I'm gonna be okay. And a lot of folks don't do that. I shocked my staff a while back and I said, I got pulled over and I was scared. You're scared, you're, you're a veteran cop. I don't know that guy just like you don't know that guy. It's real for all of us. And when I stop somebody, I don't know you either. It, so, how do we how do we create this this trust amongst each other? That and and I think as policing grows and progresses, we want to be we want to embrace each other, embrace our differences, but grow as a community, so that I can call just like I can call on mom to come take care of me. I need to be able to call on a police officer to come take care of me in a time of need, and I need to be able to do that openly and with trust. And let's go to Tracy, and then we will come back here to David to, to sum up. Okay, so um, I think two of the ideas that I would have mentioned have already been mentioned. So let me just um, be um, specific in terms of recommendations by first referring back to the president's task force report. There were 59 recommendations that we offered to President Obama, and I think many of them are things that communities can try. And then also to bring back something very granular and small that John mentioned, where he was saying that um, the police officers, no, actually, I think it was you, David Williams, where people were having meals um, with, um, officers were having meals with members of the community. We know from decades of social psychological research uh, search, to have reconciliation between groups that you have to spend time. And um, Linda Trott's work at the uh, University of Amherst shows that you need about three hours. It's about a the time that you would spend having a meal uh, with someone. That You cannot underestimate the power of that. That and the importance of law enforcement leaders acknowledging their mistakes that they've made in the past and the fact that discrimination has taken place in the past and continues to make take place and leaders need to be upfront and acknowledge that. Right. Finally, David? Yeah, I, I think the future is about all of us. Um, we're all in the same boat and, and we've got to find ways to work together. The inequalities that exist with the police is just one subset of, of racial inequalities that exist. And I think we need to think of systemic, comprehensive, multi-pronged strategies that seek to address all of the inequalities that exist simultaneously so that we can really guarantee every American child, regardless of your zip code, regardless of your race, ethnicity, regardless of your religion, you are afforded access to all of the opportunities that American society offers. So it's about us coming together to create a better future for all of our children. It's a massive topic, and it's one uh, that we will obviously, uh, no doubt, revisit again, uh, race and policing. 
Uh, this has been presented by uh, the forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, jointly with PRI's The World and WGBH. Uh, we have Brian Kaur, uh, President, National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. Tracy Mears, who joined us remotely, Professor of Law, Yale Law School. John Shanks, Director, Fight Crime, Invest in Kids, Police Training Institute, retired USAF Master Instructor, and of course, a Texas Master Peace Officer. And David Williams, feels like my, my old pal David Williams, Professor of Public Health, Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences, Harvard T.H. Chan, School of Public Health. I'm Philip Martin, Senior Investigative Reporter of WGBH, and I thank you very much. We'll see you next time. If you are interested in supporting this program and others like this from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, please call 617-432-1318 for further information.